Charles Koch says he regrets dividing the country. <laughs> Come on. And this was in uh, November 2020, which like this to me is so funny, right? Because if you guys know anything about the Koch brothers, um, I believe it was Charles Koch, actually, that ran for, let's see, Charles Koch libertarian. He ran in one of the Libertarian Party elections. I think it was 1980. He ran for vice president. Oh, it was his brother, David. Okay. Yeah. So in 2019, uh, Charles's brother, David Koch, there were initially four Koch brothers. I know too much about the Kochs. Okay. So there were initially four Koch brothers. Early on, two of them sold out their stakes in the company. Um, they went on to go do other things. So then it was David and Charles who um, really grew the Coke um, company into uh, the very, very large, you know, Coke network that that came later on. Right. So it was, it was these two brothers that that blew it up into this massive thing. And that so that now that's not to say that it was a small company to begin with. They were very, very rich to begin with. Um, the Coke family fortune actually came from selling oil to both Hitler and Stalin. Um, the Koch's father was extraordinarily wealthy. Um, he was a, an extremely successful businessman um, who made a lot of money off of World War II. So going into this, they had a fortune. Um, and David Koch died in 2019. Mail Rights USA, subscribe. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. So they already had a fortune, right? And in 2019, David Koch dies. So, okay, now the Koch network only consists of the one Koch brother, and that's Charles Koch. So then in 2000, a year later, Charles Koch comes out and is like, so turns out that all of the stuff that we've been doing for the last several decades has kind of torn this country apart. Um, sorry. <laughs> but as this article, you know, makes clear, they have continued to funnel money into Republican candidates and Republican projects, Republican think tanks, Republican institutions, that sort of thing. So if you guys don't know this, a lot of the shift that we have seen rightward since like 1980, a lot of that has come from the Koch brothers. Not only the Koch brothers themselves, but also a network of billionaires that they have purposefully befriended, made businesses alliances with, connected to themselves and connected to each other. So in 1980, David Koch decided that he was going to run as the vice president for the liber oh, Robert Murdoch. Yes, Robert Murdoch is another big player. Um, so he decided he was going to run as the, as the vice president for the Libertarian Party. Well, he lost. So when this happens, they sit down, the two brothers, and they have a think about this. And they go, okay, so maybe trying to play from the inside doesn't work, right? If we really want to influence politics, instead of running for office and getting a position, what we need to do is, um, <laughs> chat, we're being intellectually outpaced. Yeah, I'm ignoring you guys. <laughs> You're all shit posting. I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you important stuff. So they decide, okay, actually playing within the system doesn't work. What we can do is we can buy the system. We can cheat the system and we can rework it in the ways that we want to see it. So there is a fantastic book about this. It's called Dark Money. Um, it's written by Jane Meyer, who was a correspondent for the, um, for the New York Times for a, a long while. She also wrote a really, really, really in-depth, um, really great book about um, the war on terror as well. It's called The Dark Side. <laughs> so um, actually, she also wrote a book about the subject we were just talking about. Great author, love her work. So she wrote a book called Dark Money. And Dark Money opens, Dark Money opens in the year 2009. After Obama was elected, 
the Koch brothers were like, this is bad news. Because as you may have gathered from hearing that the Koch brothers tried to run for the Libertarian Party, I, I wouldn't call them libertarians. Um, I would say that they're actually, I want to say somewhat close to or, or in the realm of anarcho-capitalists. The Koch brothers are obviously very pro-big business, you know, big, um, they're big supporters of capitalism, big supporters of, you know, business. However, um, they hate the government, hate it. So a lot of rollbacks that we saw in regulations, um, a lot of rollbacks of workers' rights, that was because of the Koch brothers. Um, they single-handedly got a lot of legislation passed that um, worked to favor big businesses and extremely large corporations because that's what they thought was good. Again, they have this like, not even just ideological, but people who, who've sat down and like biographers and people who have spent time around them personally um, talk about almost this like personal seething contempt for authority. And in their eyes, the government in this country is this like extraordinarily cancerous authority. So I think that there's a lot of people here who would go, well, yeah, I mean, the United States government is like evil. So yes, but the thing is, they don't think the United States government is evil because it covers up war crimes, because it engages in imperialism. They think that the United States government is evil because it won't let them poison the rivers. <laughs> so like, you know, it, it's, it's a very, um, very distinct difference in uh, worldview. <laughs> so there are a lot of ways in which the Koch brothers have influenced legislation, politicians, and the direction that this country has gone in. Um, ANCAPs are not anarchists. The dad of their religion, David Friedman, said they are not anarchists. Anarchism is working with the people. I actually agree with you on that one. Um, I actually agree with you. I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think that it's, I don't know that you could call yourself an anarchist and still believe in capitalism, right? Because that's very clearly um, unjust hierarchy. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you on that. But so, you know, the term is anarcho-capitalist. So, I mean, they're beyond libertarian, right? They are anarcho-capitalists. They would like to dismantle as much of the government as possible. Um, the Koch brothers would like to see us all living in their company towns, buying their script, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, no, they don't view capitalism as unjust. They actually think capitalism will save the people and it's, it's the best thing ever. So they realize after David loses the election in 1980, they realize this is not going to work for us. So what they do is they go, hmm, I guess we'll have to influence the way people think because right now there's just not the public opinion and there's just not the public support to um, support our beliefs and to vote someone like us into office. So what they do is they take their enormous wealth and they start putting it into universities. Now, when I say they start putting it into universities, what I mean is they start donating like wings to universities. They start funding classes and programs, economics programs. They start finding the correct teachers, giving funds to Milton Friedman types, Chicago boys types. You donate a wing to a university and you go, okay, well, you know, we're going to pay you this however many million or however many hundreds of thousands of dollars to help you build this wing and to help institute this economic program. And we're going to call it the American Freedom Project. But if you're going to take our money, well, this is who's going to teach this program. So then when you get this professor in and they start teaching this program, well, they're not teaching, you know, conventional economics. They're not even, you know, they're not teaching different kinds of ideas. They're teaching you straight up, um, uh, you know, workers' rights are bad. <laughs> Corporations having regulations are bad. They start teaching this, you know, really, really extremely radical um, far right view of economics and just passing it off like it's normal. And, you know, there's not a lot of people blowing the whistle on it because, it's not labeled the um, super far right, we would like to poison the waters and we're going to follow anyone who blows the whistle on us, have them followed by private investigators in cars 
and we are going to uh, make sure that all of the workers get paid three dollars an hour project it's called the american freedom project so they start doing things like this right and they start indoctrinating these college students because this is another thing that they're concerned about, right? They're talking about how, you know, all these college students, they're too left, they're too liberal. So they go, well, you know, how do we make people think what we want to think? Well, we get them while they're young. We get our influences in the schools. We start teaching people, well, this is just how the world is. This is just how it should be. So they donate, you know, wings and institutions. They set up programs. They start getting, you know, professors in the colleges to start teaching the things they want them to teach, but they don't stop there. Because the thing is, that's not enough. It doesn't work if it's just that, right? You have to fully and completely shape the culture. But the thing is, oftentimes you lose the culture war when you believe in these things, right? So you know how we talk about gerrymandering? Um, and we talk about how a lot of Republicans tend to win elections because they gerrymander and they cheat. Well, the Kochs realize they're going to have to do the same thing. They realize they can't just hit people from one end. If you want control of a system, you have to you have to put your little tentacles everywhere. This is actually why it's called, and this is really a really goofy name, but it's called the Coctopus, which is like, it's goofy, but it's unfortunately wildly accurate. So while they're funding these programs and while they're indoctrinating the kids at school, they're also realizing that they need to fund these think tanks and these institutions. They need to have the people um, who are writing for the newspapers, well, they need to have them also in their pocket. So you need to get people writing op-eds that are sympathetic to you and your causes. You need to get think tanks pushing out studies and you know showing statistics that um, align with your worldview. So then we get things like, The Heritage Foundation. So the Heritage Foundation is, this might not be the Mellon Camps, this might be, who, here we go. Yep, the course, the course. So the Koch brothers, they start networking with um, the Coors family. They network with the Olin family, the Mellon Camp family. All of these families, these billionaire families, and these people who own these huge mega corporations, and the Kochs realize they can't do this on their own. You can't transform a country through one corporation on your own. But the Kochs realize something that a lot of us realize as well. And I have to pick Eddie up over there. I know, you want to get up? Whoa, good girl. <sighs> so the Kochs realize something that a lot of us realize as well. And what they realize is that class consciousness matters. So they say, okay. So they realize that their class interests, well, it's also the class interests of all of these other billionaire families. And if they want to reshape our country in a way that's beneficial to them, well, they're going to need some help. The Cato Institute, the Adam Smith Foundation, um, the Council on Foreign Affairs. Yeah, so there's a ton of think tanks. There's a ton of think tanks that um, begin to be formed by these people, right? So the Heritage Foundation was just the, the first one that came to mind. There's also the Brookings Institute. Um, wait, no, the Brookings, I'm sorry, the Brookings Institute is, uh, hold on, is this the, the um, I'm thinking of something different that's um, left wing. Cato? Yeah, so the Cato Institute is, let's see. The Cato Institute is another really famous one. They're also a think tank. And see, you can see here, it's uh, individual liberty, free markets, and peace. But the thing is, they name themselves these sort of vague names, and they give themselves these very innocuous, actually very positive sounding taglines. But meanwhile, they push for policies that help huge corporations and make our lives a lot harder. Yep, see? Tax and budget policy, criminal justice, that sort of thing. So yeah, a lot of these end up pushing out um, a ton of super far-right Republican propaganda. So the Koch brothers realize that these things are going to be really necessary as well. You can't just fill the schools. 
You should fill the schools. You have to fill the schools if you want to see your version of reality. You have to build from the ground up. Have you guys ever heard the term, I, I, a bunch of you will have heard this, um, astroturfed? So astroturf is fake grass. Astroturf is the grass that they lay down inside of stadiums, inside of arenas. Um, if you went to a nice college or a nice high school, um, that the grass that they would have for their sports uh, practice areas, that's astroturf. So astroturfing in politics is to disguise or orchestrate a marketing or public relations campaign in such a way as to present it as having arisen from unsolicited public comments. So they have these like synthetic grass movements that they, that they facilitate, but it, they're not really grassroots movements. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, people that work for these foundations, people that work for these think tanks who go out and who act like, well, they're just normal citizens. They're just people with concerns. But their concerns are not their concerns. Their concerns are um, the Koch brothers' agenda, the Coors family's agenda, the Olin Mellencamp's family's agenda, this sort of thing. Um, yeah, Turning Point USA, that would be a good one. The Tea Party, that was another good one. Yep. So they start realizing that um, they're going to need, they're going to need these synthetic grassroots movements. They're going to need um, a foothold in the colleges. They're going to need um, think tanks. They're going to need opinion pieces in newspapers and magazines that support what they have to say. But the other thing that they realize that they're going to have to do is they're going to have to get in at the very, very ground level. So they begin this with the astroturfing, but then they take it to another level. So let's see. Oh. Others. Local elections. This is from Business Insider. Since the 1970s, they personally donated at least $100 million to their causes. That's insane. Wait, what? A group associated? Hold on, this is a crazy high number. A group associated with the Cokes announced its plans to raise $889 million leading up to the 2016 elections. You cannot imagine the kind of money that these people have poured into shaping our country in the way that they want to see it. People talk about money in politics. This is the sort of thing that they're talking about. The reason why things look the way they are, the reason why so many of the young people in this country are very progressive and even millennials. Fuck, there's even, you know, a good portion of Gen Xers that are, cons that are, are, are relatively liberal um, and relatively progressive. And the reason why our country has this radical, insane Republican hold on it is because it's not about what the people want. It's not about democracy. It's not about the values that you and I hold. It's about the Koch brothers raising $889 million leading up to the 2016 elections. So something else that they realized was local politics matters. And this is something that I've screamed, you know, I've been screaming about for forever, right? Over and over and over again. The things that happen on a national level do affect your life. They really do. But the things that affect your life the most are the things that happen in your local communities, right? So like the, the laws uh, that are, that are um, being, being implemented by your state senate, by your, your state house members, um, what your city council is deciding to do. Like here in Austin, the camping ordinance, um, that affected a ton of people's lives here in Austin. Nothing to do with politics on a, on a, a federal or a, na a nationwide scale. All local, right? So local, local politics affects so much. And the Koch brothers realized this. So what they did when they started doing the AstroTurf movement um, and, you know, these, these grassroots campaigns, these grassroots campaigns, well, they started pouring, um, I mean, obscene amounts of money into small local elections. And at the time, before people knew what they were doing, it was wild, right? So people were running against their, their opponents, and their opponents were just, I mean, outspending them like crazy, right? For like, like local, local stuff, right? You know, and, and, and a lot of these people were like, what is happening here? You know? And then they started finding, well, um, turns out 
that the Koch brothers were finding local elections and pouring like $100,000 into these local elections to back these super far-right candidates that never would have had a chance to win otherwise. They were finding these key districts or these districts that they decided um, were really important because, you know, they've got a ton of researchers, they have a ton of polling at their disposal, um, and, and they were finding these, like, really small districts that, like, you know, I guess Democratic um, strategists and, and campaign people weren't thinking about, you know, the, the, the DNC was not sending massive amounts of money to these small candidates, and the Koch brothers realized there was an opportunity there, and they were pouring tons of money into these small candidates, and they were winning these local elections. And so then they were beginning to shape the country from every single level. And now we live not in the hellscape that they wish we would live in. But I mean, I think we all know here that this country has been moving. We have definitely seen the Overton window in this country shift in a very rightward direction. And a lot of it is because of behind the scenes maneuvering from massive dark money from people like the Koch brothers and from all of the other billionaires that have joined into their network to reshape this country um, in, in this horrific sort of uh, pro-corporation, anti-worker, anti-environment hellscape <laughs> that they wish it to be. Conservatives are better at electoral politics. Yeah, I mean, conservatives are like absolutely kicking our ass when it comes to electoral politics. How are we shifting right when we are so much more progressive? Yeah. So what you're talking about is like really superficial culture war stuff. Um, I'm talking about like, well, it's like 10% of Americans are in a union now. Um, regulations on the environment have absolutely rolled back. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of like, we're now a corporatocracy. Corporations are now people, money is speech. I mean, yeah, you can say like, oh, we're not mean to gay people anymore, but like trans people still don't have, like we still don't have healthcare. Um, you know, trans people are still not even respected the way they need to be. Um, we have seen a shifting of judgeships to be filled with right-wing positions. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you want to like, you can point to a few key things and go, oh, this is getting more progressive because as I just demonstrated, the people in this country are more progressive, but we're not talking about the will of the people. I, you know, I just laid out for you the way that, that legislation and policy has shifted in a way that is much, much, much more beneficial to corporations. So, you know, we have, um, Alec, the American Legislative Council, uh, Exchange Council, which um, Alec writes up a bunch of policy and hands it out to politicians and then literally writes bills and hands it to politicians and they go, here, go ahead and present this on the floor as if this was your bill that you wrote and you thought up and politicians go and do it. Alec, who is aligned with Geocorp, Geocorp, which is one of the leading uh, uh, for-profit prison corporations in this country, Geocorp. Oh, Geogroup. I'm sorry. Geogroup, which is, let's see, 140 correctional detention and community re-entry re -entry facilities. So yeah, I mean, we have one of the most incarcerated populations in the world. And guess what? That serves the private prisons that make money off of those people. And then when those people are in the prisons, they literally do slave labor for corporations like Victoria's Secret. I mean, if you guys don't know this, Victoria's Secret gets a ton of their stuff made by inmates making, what are they making? Like less than a dollar a day or something? Yeah, I mean... You can say, like, oh, the people are not trying to electrically shock gay people into not being gay anymore, so, oh my god, we're so progressive now. But, like, behind the scenes, and when it comes to things that actually matter, you, you know, the income gap is widening between the rich and the poor. Like, I, I think it's really, really hard um, to point to, like, one or two things that are good and be like, what are you talking about? The country's not getting more right-wing. We are. We're much more of a corporatocracy um, than we've ever been in our entire history. 
I disagree with you on some stuff, but I think you're 100% right about the prison industrial complex. Yeah, the prison industrial complex is absolutely fucking absurd. What is it? It's like we, we here in America, we host like like 25% of the world's prisoners. Yeah. And and GeoGroup, let's see, is, is GeoGroup part of Alec? GeoGroup's parent company, Wacken Hut Corporation, has funded the American Legislative Exchange Council. They are also a member as of 2010. Yeah, so I think if you're going to sit here and be like, oh, but you, you know, what do you mean we're more right wing? That's what I mean. I mean, corporations can can poison our rivers and engage in environmental racism and build pipelines through the territories of Native Americans and nothing happens. I think that the things that you're pointing to are like extremely superficial. You're like, oh, look at this. And then no, don't look at all of that over there. So no, I, I, I don't think that you can make the argument. Let's see, what was, what was, let's see, union membership. Let's look at the decline of union membership over time in this country. Let's see, union membership across decades. 50 years of shrinking union membership. I mean, this stuff speaks for itself. Look at that. So let's go back to 1964. So let's see. 45, 14, 36, 38, 45, 41, 38. Let's get to 1970. Okay. Lowering a little bit. 1980. Starting to lower a little bit more. Wow. Look at that. From 1980 to 1990. We just cleaned out the South, crippled our unions. 2000, continuing in the same direction, decimating, decimated the South, um, working our way up through the Midwest over here. By the time 2010 rolls around, we've gutted a ton of the middle of the country. We are free country. People do not want to pay union dues. Does anyone, uh, does any else remember when they tried to union in Amazon, but the people voted against it? Let's see, Amazon Union. Yeah, there was a ton of pressure on people not to unionize. Let's see, so they're actually voting again now. There was after, this is so funny that you, you talk about like, oh, they just didn't want to unionize. So after that union vote happened, there was a bunch of information that came out that people were coerced into not voting for it. This is an enormous thing that happens. There's so much anti-union propaganda that comes out. Um, when people want to try and unionize, it's a very, very difficult process. And employers will often come in and say, you're not going to have a job if you unionize. They often send in people to do anti-union propaganda. Um, people are, are threatened and coerced and terrified of trying to form unions. And now they're trying it again. This was February 4th. This was 10 days ago. They're doing a second vote. They're trying to do it again because they do want to unionize. The people in Amazon literally have to pee in bottles because they can't go to the bathroom. I paid union dues for seven years and barely noticed it out of each check. Yeah, they legitimately broke laws to influence how people voted. They scare people into voting against the unions and bring like they they make them watch videos that are filled with lies and they scare the shit out of them. Yeah, this is a terrible argument.